50 years after the Soviets launched Sputnik, what has the space race accomplished? And is the money spent on space exploration still bringing us benefits? This is Inside Story. Hello, I'm Sami Zaydan. Well, it's been 50 years since the Soviets launched Sputnik and kicked off decades of space exploration. Without the pioneering satellite, you wouldn't be able to watch this program. And our Virgie explains how one small satellite changed our lives. 1957, the Soviet Union launches Sputnik into space from a missile designed to carry bombs capable of striking the United States. But in the end, it was the satellite that made the news. It prompted U.S. President John F. Kennedy to announce plans to send man to the moon. Well, this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. And started a space race between the two Cold War rivals. In the end, only the states sent humans to the moon, with Neil Armstrong becoming the first man to walk on the moon in July 1969. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Humans haven't been to the moon since 1972, but five space agencies now contribute to the International Space Station, a manned research center orbiting Earth. But it's satellites, not space stations, that have had the most direct impact on our daily lives. They gave humans their first glimpse of Earth from space. And today they do everything from bring satellite channels and world events to televisions across the globe, to beaming back images that help weather forecasters and show us when a hurricane is coming. But satellites also keep an eye on other dangers. Rockets launch satellites that allow countries to obtain images of their enemies. And scientists analyzed these satellite images from Myanmar and found only burned earth where a village had been just years earlier, pictures of what some allege to be human rights abuses. All things that scientists didn't predict would happen when launching Sputnik 50 years ago and just part of the satellite's contribution to human history. Well, if you're thinking of going into space yourself, not so fast. There are a few things to consider first. Only four people have gone into space as paying passengers, all within the last six years. The first was Dennis Tito, an American who went up in 2001. Well, a South African computer millionaire and a U.S. businessman followed in separate trips shortly afterwards. Sources say they paid 20 million U.S. dollars each for the experience. Then just last year, Anusha Ansari, an Iranian-American woman, took the trip. She, like others before her, had months of training and tests at Russia's space program. Her advice to budding astronauts, dream, dream big, dream the impossible, and make it come true. But it's clearly not for the faint-hearted or for those with shallow pockets. Well, joining our discussion today, our guests in Amsterdam, Mark Heppener, head of the Science and Applications Division at the European Space Agency. In Boston, Farouk Al-Baz, a research professor and the director of the Center for Remote Sensing at Boston University. And in Colorado, Loring Werbel from Citizens for Peace in Space Group. He's also an author and a space expert. Thank you all for joining us. If I could start with Mr. Heppener. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that Sputnik changed our lives, would it? I think indeed, Sammy, you're absolutely right with that. I think it's hard to imagine even a world today without the space assets we have developed since. Uh, think not only of, of, of human spaceflight, think in particular also of the advantages in communication, in weather prediction, also the debate on global change. Think of what is now emerging in, in navigations as a, as a very useful tool. It's very difficult to imagine how all our lives would leak li look like if we wouldn't have those things available right now. All right, let's bring uh, Mr. Werbel into the discussion here. Your group is concerned about some aspects of the space quest. Well. Some would argue that it's made the world a safer place. I would definitely agree with Mr. Hepler on such applications as agriculture, uh, weather forecasting. These are benefits for 
even the poorest citizens of the world. Where we would uh, worry about things is the transition of intelligence satellites from an initial goal of arms control to their present goal of war fighting. And that mostly has to do with who controls the resources. The U.S. government in this case has taken on control of too much of orbital space and that's uh, the essence of the problem as we see it. All right, let's bring Mr. Farouk al-Baz. You've worked with uh, NASA, you've worked with uh, space exploration programs. Do you agree with that view from Mr. Werbel? In some ways, yes, except for the fact that uh, the potential uh, use of the space uh, in armaments on in war is really very small. We have had all kinds of uh, uses of uh, space and the orbit about the Earth, and we have seen that it has helped humanity in all kinds of different ways, and the potential use of it in uh, military applications is small, because we also had in the past aerial uh, photography uh, that w and aerial surveillance from the military uh, while there were all kinds of uses of in civil aviation so i really I'm, i would not worry about that it will be a very small percentage of using space all right mr heppner would the world benefit more if, uh, if space programs even if the focus is small as dr farouk al baz is is making there the point he's making but it would be better if these programs focused more on solving the world's problems like finding water sources and uh, figuring out uh, how to track environmental changes rather than how to guide missiles well, I, I would definitely agree to that, and um, at least at ESA, the European Space Agency, this is also what we are aiming at. We have no military side to our programs, uh, but the things you describe are the things that are actually happening today. The remote sensing satellites indeed are looking for water, are tracking deforestation in the, in the tropics, are uh, trying to, to really monitor the, the, the state of the environment and indeed improve also medical applications, providing a medical help to remote areas where otherwise it would not be available. I, I think overall the average is, is quite clear that this is a program that is very be beneficial for humanity. All right. Uh, um Perhaps we can bring uh, Mr. Werbel back into the discussion. You talk about your concern for how national programs are, are utilizing space exploration. Is there really an alternative, though? As long as you have governments funding uh, space exploration, is it really practical to expect them not to try and look out for, as they would put it, their own self-defense interests? I would never expect any government, uh, even say China, which has just launched its manned space program, to be willing to put everything under the control of the United Nations. Uh, what I would expect or would like to see would be an acknowledgement that space is meant to be a common shared resource. What we've seen with the national space policy of October 2006 is a declaration by the United States that it controls orbital space and other nations can only enter orbital space uh, if their goals coincide with those of the U.S. That's just a duplication of what the British said about sea lanes two, 200 years ago. All right, Mr. Heppner, is there, do you think there are enough international conventions or rules and regulations governing um, who can colonize what, who can lay claim to what in space? Uh, are rules and regulations perhaps slow to catch up with, with technological advancements? Well, that's an interesting question. There is there is a field which is known as space law, which which looks into these matters. It, however, if I talk from my personal experience, I I think what is happening in in space today between the space agencies is is really a debate. Uh, from my point of view, I talk with with everybody in the world active in space. I talk on the one hand with the Chinese, but also with the Americans and the Russians, and we really regard each other as colleagues who try to achieve something in common. If you talk, for example, of, of future exploration missions of, of space to Mars or Moon, everybody agrees on it that this should be a common endeavor for all mankind and not something where one individual space agency could, could rule what the others are going to do. So uh, I don't know about regulations. I look at practice and I see that in practice we are all working together. All right, let's talk a little more about practice and bring uh, Professor Farouk al -Baz back into the discussion. Do you think in the early days, and you worked on the, in the early days of some of these space programs, did anyone really envisage some of the perhaps you could call them byproducts of launching satellites into uh, space such as pushing the boundaries of media freedoms and human rights in some of repressive countries in the world? 
Uh, first, I will go back to the uh, question about the United Nations. There is the uh, International Convention for the Peaceful Uses of Space, and that has passed through the United Nations. And the, uh, the, the idea is to use space for uh, peaceful purposes. Whoever will use it some, uh, some other way would be going against that convention. In the meantime, one of the most significant thoughts that we should keep in mind is the fact that the space programs in, in any uh, country is not just designed to seek knowledge or scientific knowledge. Most of the space programs were developed and are developing today to raise the level of technology, science and technology in the country. The American space program was not designed to send a man to the moon. It was designed to raise the level of science and technology in the US because there were, f there were fears that the Soviet Union has actually exceeded in science and technology. And how do you do it? You start a, a program like this, which would raise the level of science and technology. Now, during the early days when we were working with Apollo, naturally no one could have foreseen the idea of what the, the communication satellites are going to do. And we just wanted to have a communication system so that we can communicate with the astronauts while they are around the Earth and around the moon. And now that is a huge revolution that has caused us all to be in touch with uh, each other. And there are the, the little things that we did that we had no idea will, will be internationally uh, available to everybody, like the very first fax machine was a, 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 a huge structure about 12 feet wide and 8 feet high, and it has a, a, a slit in the middle, and we would put a piece of paper in it from Houston to come out in Washington, in Washington D.C. after 10, 15 minutes, after the whole thing would shake up and then boom, 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 boom for 10, 15 minutes. And now the fax machine is in everybody's home and for office and so on. So no one expected to see the kinds of things that were developed at the time to be so internationally useful for humanity worldwide. Well, the future is sometimes a little unpredictable. It is now time for a short break. When we come back, we'll talk about how the future of space exploration is shaping up. Stay with us.